Welcome to the Nucleate Podcast. My name is Sam Kessel. And I'm Bianca Williams. And today we're honored to have Dr. Fiona Mack joining us today. She's the head of Bayer's CoLab with the mission to support early stage biotech by providing them with the lab space, mentorship, and resources to succeed. Fiona has extensive experience in pharma working at Pfizer, Roche, Ipsen, and Johnson & Johnson prior to joining Bayer. She earned her BS from Cornell and her PhD in molecular biology at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining the Nuclear Podcast today, Fiona. Really, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Bianca, so much for the invitation. So to get us started, my first question that I'd love to ask you is, can you please tell me a bit about your background and your inspirations for pursuing your current career path? Excellent, thank you. So I grew up in Kentucky. You know, I was raised by a single mother, the youngest of, of three. And I exhibited a very early aptitude for, for science. You know, I was that nerdy little kid who'd ask for microscopes for Christmas and would go down to my local creek and look at experimental samples and really try to explore my world through, through those eyes. Uh, you know, as being a bright child, certainly coming from a more impoverished background, the road to success was really more geared towards, you know, you become a doctor, you become a lawyer. That was very clear of how what was representative as a pathway, but I always liked science. And so I was trying to figure out what else can we do within that field? So without really understanding what a molecular biologist does each mm -hmm. day, I wanted to pursue that, that path. So as Sam said, I went on to Cornell to um, do my undergraduate school mm -hmm. there and really got into doing a lot of the lab courses. Like I was uh, excelled at quantitative chemistry, like that was <laughs> really, once again, something I was really quite, quite good at, and then really started to um, love the biology and genetics from those uh, fruit fly labs that we used to do. Am I dating myself if I, <laughs> if I talk about that? Maybe they don't do that anymore. And then also a lot of like the molecular cloning experiments that, that we would done. And so part of the, the benefit of going to graduate school is that you can do various rotations mm -hmm. and different labs and really begin to understand what really is your drive and what you skills that you're great at. And so at the University of Pennsylvania, I first thought I wanted to be a crystallographer mm -hmm. until I realized what they do every day, which is like quite various tedious. But then I wanted to explore really this idea of doing more translational work, translational medicine and potentially how to think about human disease how to understand that disease, and then how to impact that disease. And so really it's my, my graduate career kind of set me along this path with how to really try to think about medicines and impacting human disease. So that's a really great segue. So even growing up, you imagined yourself as a scientist. Um, when you entered your PhD program, did you know early on, you know, were you still that set on being you know, the academic version of scientist, or did you know relatively early on that you wanted to pursue a career in industry? No, no. So when I was at the University of Pennsylvania, it was still rather taboo to go into industry. This was not the place where they were really cultivating a lot of early stage entrepreneurs, not like it is as of today. And certainly for those of you in this Cambridge, you know, Boston environment, this is kind of old hat for you, but it was still very new. And um, when I was back in graduate school, so there were just a, a few professors that had kind of collaborations with industry, but it wasn't seen as a place where you actually go to do science. Uh, but for me, trying to, my, what I wanted to do is really, I love the foundations of biology. I love understanding the, the basics of biology and the basis of disease, but really wanted to see how can we actually utilize that to impact patients. And from there, it was I had been doing my postdoc, my advisor, and also had a collaboration with industry. He had perhaps a, a new target that could be a nice uh, potential drug, really, to look at the interaction of you know, crest cells and endothelial cells uh, mm -hmm. could kind of form the cardiac outflow track. And from there, it just became much more logical. It's like, okay, maybe moving into industry is an option. So as I was looking for opportunities, I wanted to make sure that I found one that did have that scientific rigor, mm -hmm. right? That still wanted to understand the biology, but still had a very kind of clear line to how we develop therapeutics. So it's certainly something that was not a initial goal. And I said, mm -hmm. at the point was actually frowned upon. I don't think that my professor at the time was quite quite pleased when you didn't want to follow into their, their foot tracks of really mm -hmm. following the, the grant money. Um, but I do think for long term, in terms of what I felt was going to be a purposeful life, mm -hmm. really going the translational lines and that was advantageous. That's great. So it was really about impact mm -hmm. at the end of the day for you. And it also sounds like it was a natural evolution over time. It wasn't 
coming in saying, I immediately want to do industry. It was as you gained more experience, you were trying to get more impact from the work that you did. You want to see that more concrete path that you decided to make that. Yeah, I mean, that's my road to life, right? Yes. I think if you start laying out a, a career path, it can look very linear, like and everything was highly intentional on how you mm -hmm. move from one step to the other. Other times it's, it was just very opportunistic. You know, I, I certainly had times where I was, you know, collecting those kind of 2 a.m. time points and just thought like, this is my life. This is what it's like to, to be a scientist and, and writing papers was, was quite the uh, achievement and getting mm -hmm. wonderful publications and getting grants. But then it was also at some point, it's like the basic research is wonderful, but I live in this world where I think I want to see a more human connection to, to what I'm doing. Fantastic. So if you could go back in time and give yourself some advice um, while you're still in your PhD training, what would you have told yourself uh, to help plan your career out or um, how you would handle things differently now? Mm -hmm. I think I would be less afraid of change. Mm. Um, and really just think about what are skill sets that are really transferable um, to make sure that you are open to all these options. So I think I, I really wish I hadn't thought so much about the, the no and taking some of perhaps people who weren't as supportive of me and really kind of taking those thoughts uh, into the hand and having that be a bit more of a hindrance. I think I would have mm -hmm. embraced um, more risk <laughs> even mm -hmm. at, at that age and been more forthright. I, it's been wonderful. Like I had a fairly successful uh, PhD career. So I think it's a great foundation to show that you can think scientifically, you can work independently, you can be productive. And I wish I'd really leveraged that a lot more to think about all the other career opportunities I, I could have really pushed myself to. Interesting. And I, I'm curious about the forthright piece. How did you, how do you think about that? Or how would you encourage someone to be more forthright? Um, I'm, I'm guessing with your superiors in that case, like being more candid um, when you're considering something different. Yeah, I think people have more options now or just the more um, ideas of what success is look like, right? So they've been able to see oftentimes their peers who are able to to do this move would become early stage entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. friends who have progressed into to industry. I just think there's more of a, a laid out playbook now to mm -hmm. kind of challenge things. But I do think that very much hinges upon you actually showing that you've been productive in some some respects in your, your career. You have to have some kind of foundation of knowledge in order to to base that and be able to go and be forthright with your, <laughs> your boss. But here's yeah. the path that I want to craft. And if you've been a very good student, a very good scientist, I often find that you can build that network. So that's the other thing I think I would go back to and find myself is really leverage as much as those connections that you have, some of which can lead to an extra job, but others really just give you that advice. So mm -hmm. mentorship is so much more important than I think I understood at that early age. That makes a lot of sense. So even when you left academia, you still spent nearly a decade in scientist roles at, mm -hmm. at Pfizer Roche before pivoting to an external innovation role. Can you tell us about what inspired that change and how you, you moved from really you know, being in the lab to really focusing on the business side? How did that transition mm -hmm. happen? And, and we'd love to learn more about external innovation. Exactly. So I started off as a bench scientist at, at Pfizer. Actually, I was at a company that got acquired by Pfizer. And if anybody mm -hmm. knows Pfizer history, they acquire a lot of companies. Yep. So mm -hmm. you'll start running into Pfizer people at all time because we all got acquired by them at, at some point. Um, so there was always a, a lot of change in the course of those seven years that I, that I was there, changing in leadership, changes in focus areas. But one thing that it allowed me, like I think I had seven different managers in six different years, so a lot, a lot of change. But through that, I worked on a lot of projects, um, which enabled me to understand the fundamentals of a lot of different modalities. So mm -hmm. I worked with external partners, so early stage companies such as uh, Macrogenics, uh, Seattle Genetics mm -hmm. at the time, to really understand these novel modalities. So I developed an expertise in antisense therapies, mm -hmm. I developed an understanding by specific T-cell engagers, yeah. um, antibody drug conjugates, because I was kind of that point person who was helping like large pharma crack, what are kind of the key go-no-go -no -go experiments to really move those technologies on into clinically, preclinical enabling studies, so mm -hmm. IND enabling studies. And so from there, you know, I got very, started to understand what it takes to get a molecule into the clinic. Mm -hmm. And then I felt I understood how to kind of translate what's necessities back to 
uh, biotech or what they need to get done with the level of rigor that large pharma is expecting, okay. but then also to kind of push the pharma side to realize there are lots of things that are nice to have, but not necessarily critical for decision making. Mm -hmm. So after being there for about seven years, I just wanted to understand that's great from a discovery perspective and getting into the clinic. Now, what happens next, right? Mm -hmm. How do we actually start thinking about, instead of my animal experiments, right? How do you do the human mm -hmm. experiments? So I wanted to learn more about the developmental aspects of it, right? So moving from the R to the, the big D mm -hmm. of it. So I started looking for opportunities that would then take me perhaps away from the bench and into more of these more business development roles. And that was actually quite quite a shift. You know, as scientists, we always define ourselves as scientists. And what does that mean? Pipetting yep. at a bench or directing another team of scientists to do those experiments. Now, if you start to step away from that, like what then are you bringing to the table? And what I realized it really is that um, comprehensive analysis that, that we would do, that, that critical thinking that we have, that understanding of the strategic endpoints and really how to relate information back to some of the decisions mm -hmm. points. And that is what is really quite critical for these new business development roles. Interesting. So really, you developed your foundational understanding of early stage drug development. And over time, you gain that strategic perspective using the experiments you did and thinking about the science, you started thinking bigger picture over time in terms of what experiments are actually are necessary for a drug to continue further. And, and it sounds like there was a bit of a leap to move from the bench to you know, the development side of R&D. Mm -hmm. um, so was there like a, a specific moment or was it a change in jobs that resulted in that? And was it like, how did you navigate that transition? Yeah, it was definitely a change in jobs. So for being at Pfizer's making a concerted effort to how do I move into that next step? And that particular organization, things are very segmented. So mm -hmm. there's a group that did things up to preclinical IND, then there was a complete handoff to clinical development. And mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of bridging between there. So there wasn't easy to kind of transition into that organization. So I started for looking for opportunities that would give me that kind of clinical exposure. And so that meant obviously looking outside. Um, I, you know, I tell this as also, once again, a very intentional story and like mm -hmm. I was all very happy in the end, but you know, there were some, some downsides there. Mm -hmm. Like I was really, you know, felt my career was it, was it moving forward. I was very well respected for, you know, doing these kind of early stage preclinical work, but mm -hmm. it wasn't seeing that level of, of progression. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even at, at one point I took some time off, I spent about a month cycling through Vietnam and, oh, wow. and Cambodia mm -hmm. with, with a girlfriend and, and um, we just had a, a great time. And there was a, at one point, you know, it was just really lamenting coming back into this job and having to do the same thing over and over again. They even called an ex-boyfriend at the time. He's like, I think I'll just hang out in Cambodia, maybe teach English, do some <laughs> bartending. And he's like, oh. that's not you. <laughs> he's like, get yourself together, figure out what you want to do next, and, and then come home. And so after that, it's like, he's right. Here, I know what I like. I want to continue in doing drug development. I want to be able to translate those highly innovative ideas to actual drugs and get them into patients and get them onto the market. Let me find roles that can enable that. Mm -hmm. And so with that in mind, I Roche was at the time also wanting someone who had kind of preclinical experience. Mm -hmm. It also worked with entrepreneurs and wanted to develop these models for externalizing drug discovery and development. Got so it. that would be bridging everything I knew from the bench mm -hmm. to how I worked with entrepreneurs and now bringing these new molecules into the clinic and new indications. And then from there, that brought it out to a much broader group that was strictly focused on external innovation at Roche. So they now wanted a team of people who could do this exact same thing, access all the assets that could complement the oncology portfolio, mm -hmm. develop a kind of scope of work playbook for how they could be evaluated internally and what are gonna be those kind of key no-go decisions for us to do some onboarding. Got it. Um, I would say, I, I want to touch on this for just a minute. It's really interesting that you, you were pretty intentional about the pivot, but it sounds like there was, um, a couple of like in between decision points. It wasn't a straightforward path. <laughs> it wasn't plotted out years in advance. It, it sounds like it was a frustration point and that getting out of your environment, like going somewhere completely different, like in Vietnam and Cambodia helped facilitate that shift into the career path that you're you're mainly on now so out, outside of the bench you're now leveraging your experience there and applying it to business development in a way that you know someone without that experience certainly couldn't do so it's interesting to hear that it wasn't plotted out it wasn't planned 
it was it was a big it, it sounds like this was like a jump right like before it sounded like you're saying like it was a gradual shift to decide to go to industry but this shift between you know being from the bench to being in the development side mm -hmm. the business development side of things that was more of a big jump yes um but and that was nonlinear. So that, that's a very interesting part. Yeah, of it was that. definitely a conscious effort to kind of step away from the bench, mm -hmm. leaving that behind, how to do that. And that seems uh, a bit daunting because there are a lot of opportunities. You can do it to clinical research. You can mm -hmm. go into business development, um, you know, medical liaisons. I mean, there's lots of kind of non-bench roles that are still within kind of the pharma healthcare sphere. So it was really a bit of also waiting for the right opportunity mm -hmm. to kind of come along that, got approached by a few other jobs that would have given me that clinical expertise, but it just didn't feel right. And this, for whatever reason, this kind of one role was kind of seemed to be perfectly crafted for me because mm -hmm. it understood like I need, I had my preclinical background. It was giving me access to the development purpose and it was still doing more of the business development activities. And then from there, just more of those opportunities kind of came along where we really were responsible for like the due diligences for mm -hmm. programs from target identification up into phase one and phase two, and even helped with some of the um, acquisitions, later stage acquisitions that wish. Very cool. So that's a great segue into talking about what you're doing now at Bayer CoLab, which is really at that intersection of using your scientific background, applying it to, um, business development, among other things. So would love to learn more about Bayer CoLab. Can you tell us about the mission, the vision for the organization, and what you're trying to do to support early stage biotechs? So Bayer CoLab is a global network of life science incubators that we just opened up within the past year. So our flagship mm -hmm. site is here in Cambridge, US, with the mission to support early stage entrepreneurs and help them accelerate to that next value inflection point by really leveraging the global expertise for Bayer. So what really intrigued me about this role was that Bayer wanted to be able to offer the support to entrepreneurs and they have a variety of resources that range from you know, having their actual bid scientists here mm -hmm. within Cambridge um, to having a, a company which they had acquired, you know, uh, Blue Rock, mm -hmm. that are developing novel cell therapeutics are also right here in Cambridge, and then a very heavy presence for our uh, strategy teams, our commercialization teams, and then Bayer also has a manufacturing business. Mm -hmm. So once again, thinking about this kind of end-to-end -end need for really translating novel therapeutics into actual patients and commercial success, mm -hmm. Bayer really has that covered, and they wanted to make early stage entrepreneurs like kind of a, a cornerstone in this incubator space, a cornerstone for how we access external innovation and use it as a pipeline for funneling into our R&D strategy mm -hmm. and funneling even into our later stage CDMO businesses. Mm -hmm. Thinking that that preferred relationship that you make, that relationship that you cultivate with these early stage entrepreneurs really helps you become that preferred partner in the future. And so mm -hmm. all of that is really kind of crafted right here in Cambridge and we've been piloting out how this model system uh, can work for the past year. We now have sites that are opening up in Berlin and in Shanghai, and we also wow. have one in Kobe, all of which have like a, a different a different physical footprint, and you know they're all going to be slightly different based upon like the the local ecosystem. So we initiated the Cambridge CoLab. You know, at the time there was really a lot of investments in cell aging therapy companies, and mm -hmm. so our space was really crafted to cater to cell aging therapy early stage startups, mm -hmm. um, and we want to because we also have that expertise for CGT right there inside. That interaction between the sciences we also thought was quite key. Over the course of the past few years, I think when they initiated the idea, investments in CGT have actually certainly gone down. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to really think about what are across the therapeutic area expertise that Bayer has. So that means leaning into oncology, uh, cardiovascular, obviously that's what Bayer aspirin is usually the first thing that people think of. Mm -hmm. um, and then also these new areas of immunology. So we're very open to companies that are pre-seed to series A um, across the therapeutic areas, even those that may be developing devices or diagnostics, uh, can also be part of our, our collab. The, the premise is we really, these companies are really selected to be in collab. We want them to have certainly highly innovative science. We want them to have a very competent team, but more importantly, we want to make sure that there are resources at Bayer that can be used that can help them get to that next value inflection point faster. Mm -hmm. So that means there has to be some level of championship, someone internally that sees a vision for how that company can grow through the course of incubation. That's usually about two to three years. 
And that say, we want to see like, what can we do to, to help? And so if we don't see that there is that great connection, then we don't think that necessarily you're going to benefit from being in collabs. And then ultimately, so that this is part of business development, we need a job value from this mm -hmm. at some point. And so we want to be able to be really to be able to do deals with these companies. And so we want right. there to be some at least complementary approaches. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm, I'm curious, that it's a very broad mandate, like we work with startups globally. Um, what is your role as the head of the Bayer Collab? Like in your terms of your day to day, what is your role in supporting mm -hmm. early stage biotechs? Where do you fit into all of yeah. that? So as head, there's a lot. So first, just the, the operations for, for the site. So mm -hmm. they're responsible for the, the p and mm -hmm. uh, There's a budget. There's a cost, <laughs> obviously, a, associated with this, a management yeah. of the team that actually does the physical um, modulation of the lab space, um, but also responsible for our ecosystem engagement. So how we bear represents to the broader mm -hmm. community. Um, in terms of what are our missions, uh, what things that we want to lead, the key opinions leaders uh, in that space. And then all of this is really to serve in, in sourcing new opportunities for us. First, we have to come out and talk and articulate what is their strategy, what are the benefits of collab. So we do a lot of networking events, mm -hmm. other programming to highlight what are key interests of our areas, and other ways that we want the community or really like the field to move into things that we want them to explore. So do all that, and then ultimately, the, the true value is for our collab companies to actually have internal visibility. So I spend a lot of time also trying to understand what are their technologies, do we have synergies with anything that Bayer is doing internally, Can how do I elevate this to the senior leadership at Bayer to really make sure that we are potentially driving them to do deals with our organization. But coming into collab, it's a no strings attached, and we certainly know that not every company can do a deal with Bear, and mm -hmm. Bear won't do a deal with every company that's in our portfolio. So we also want to make sure that they are then ready to go outside mm -hmm. and be well prepared to raise their own funds and do their collaboration. So we do a lot of also educating, uh, helping them like refine their their business plan, mm -hmm. um, providing them guidance on if they want to understand the, the regulatory environment, finding internal people at Bear that can provide that level of expertise. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is doing that kind of matchmaking, like. How can we help you with our internal resources to move you to the next step, even if we aren't able to drive a deal? Um, so, for example, even today, you know, I'm talking internally with uh, for equipment uh, mm -hmm. for, for the site. What what new equipment can we bring in? Are there internal bear sequencing services right that we could give at cost, you know, to our collab residents to help them reduce their capital expenditure and utilize that money really on doing experiments? That makes a lot of sense. But it sounds like, you know, it's there's no guarantee of anything, right? Like in a way, almost like a venture investor, you are supporting a select group of startups that some of them will fail in terms of completely as a company. Some of them won't necessarily be a fit for Bayer for the long term, but at least you provide them those initial sets of resources so that they could succeed on their own without you after that stage. And it sounds like a decent number of them you do end up getting deals done uh, eventually with um, the broader well, organization. Yeah, so it's been uh, one year, so I can't say that we have okay. a deal yet. We have uh, some agreements now. We've had some procurement deals. We have a company mm -hmm. that is uh, developing a, a device. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we are is really starting those discussions. So part of the selection process is where we're reviewing their technology, we're trying to find an internal champion, and really asking as these companies incubate, what do we want to monitor? What's going to be that that uh, inflection point, what data do we want to see to really drive mm -hmm. an internal deal? So that feedback is really has been quite critical for our collab residents to understand what pharma perspective is. It also kind of keeps us on task is like, how are we thinking? You know, we're not thinking just six months out, you know, where does Bayer want to be one year from now, two years now, three years, what questions mm -hmm. do we want to address? And is the answer sitting like right in front of us? So fantastic. So what advice would you have for an entrepreneur considering applying for the collab program? So please <laughs> come come talk to us. We really are not only looking for companies that could be a great fit for our collab, as I said, we're part of business development, so we're always looking for any early stage opportunity mm -hmm. um, that could be part of our external portfolio. So part of the, even a straight business development deal. So we're all kind of work hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So we'd encourage you to think about, is your science truly innovative? 
If so, is there some connection to there that you think could truly benefit from being within the co-lab? In the Boston Cambridge area, there's a, a lot of competition for, for incubator spaces. People mm -hmm. have lots of options. We want Bear Co-lab to be a choice because you see some inherent value with learnings that Bear has. And, and those learnings can be from a discovery perspective. It could be perhaps through our own CDMO business. You know, manufacturing is quite key for mm -hmm. selling new therapy companies. Understanding those process like hurdles very early on can save you money and time and really give you that competitive advantage. So I encourage you to just reach out and, and come talk to us, come see the, the space in Cambridge. It's really mm -hmm quite bright and, and open. Um, it's managed by, by Lab Central. So any company that comes to CoLab is also gonna be part of the Lab Central community. So you get added value from, from both of those respects. Excellent. Um, and I know it's relatively new, but what would you say so far has been the most rewarding experience in starting a Bayer CoLab? Yeah. So we just had our one year anniversary and they said, I've been there from the very beginning when it's a construction site. So mm -hmm. have thinking about what does a site head do? Like, been there picking the flooring, the wallpaper, you know, what yeah. kind of coffee is served. In addition to thinking about critically, what are the types of companies that we want to have in that space? How do we be of service to them? And then how do I make sure that uh, Bear Broader, right, uh, understands what truly is valuable within this incubator space? And that's going to be what's going to drive it. So with pre preparing for that one year anniversary, we really sought out some testimonials from our, our co-lab residents. And it felt at first like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to force these people to say good things <laughs> about co-lab, <laughs> but they were actually so like heartfelt about the, um, the relationship that they had been, the attention that we were able to give them, how yeah. helpful we were throughout the organization. So we have a, a lot of people that are, I mean, we only have two people that are devoted to CoLab, but we do have the rest of the Bayer Research uh, and Innovation Center there. And oftentimes those colleagues will come and interact with our CoLab residents and offer advice mm -hmm. from regulatory to what's the best animal model to use. And yeah. so they've been all very appreciative that everyone has been really supportive of their efforts in trying to help them really succeed. Wonderful. So what's next for Bayer Collab for the long term? You know, as you mentioned, like it sounds like a lot of great testimonials. It sounds like there's been a lot of benefits to the startups that have worked there. But what, what's your vision for the long term uh, for the program? Yeah, so we are expanding globally, have the site in Berlin and in Shanghai and Kobe Brown. What I want to see within the next year is really once again driving deals with our, our collab companies mm -hmm. and us to really begin to function as a global network where we are seeing certainly a lot of companies that can have dual footprints, maybe starting in Asia, but still wanting to bridge over to the U.S. market mm -hmm. for a truly advancement. We are also seeing that there are companies that want to do clinical trials in mm -hmm. Asia and, you know, and then continue to develop their, their products here. So we see there is opportunities for a lot of back and forth. Yeah. between that and just trying to make sure they have an appropriate infrastructure that educates everyone on what is the, the ecosystem like in different areas, what are the challenges with the development, what are the opportunities with growing on, on both sides. And so that will be how our site grows. Our footprints probably won't grow, and I think that's also could be by design. We really want to cater to this kind of bespoke relationship that we have, and you can't really do that at scale. Yeah. So what we want is to show like the attention that we are giving to these select collab companies is really going to help them raise more money, do better deals, be more successful, and utilize our global presence to achieve that. Awesome. So it sounds like big growth. I mean, already you have the, the global footprint, but it sounds like building depth within each of those sites is going to be really pivotal and um, excited to see some deals get done with these companies <laughs> and with broader Bayer. So speaking about what's next and in the long term for Bayer, what are some trends in biotech that you're following uh, currently? No, thank you so much. Um, I said, I, when we first started the, or at least the idea on paper for this incubator space, it was highly focused on cell and gene therapy. That was back in 2020, well before I joined the company. And we've seen this certainly there has been a a decrease maybe about you know a quarter of what the investment had been at that time but I think that hopefully that will begin to increase again so now that we're seeing that certainly these therapies can impact monogenic disorders um, particularly the success we can see in sickle cell I'm always intrigued by what's going on in the autology field um, even though people say it's very low-hanging fruit to be able to treat some of these uh, 
genetic uh, hearing losses, but mm -hmm. I just find that it's so profound when we see a, a kid who really can't, can't hear and then the next day he can hear his mother's name and, and mm -hmm. calls to them. That is once again one of those kind of motivating factors for why we should continue to push for these therapies. But we're certainly within the next few years going to see how do they really handle these more more complex diseases like in Parkinson's or or heart failure, and those are programs that our affiliate companies Blue Rock and Asbio are developing. And I think mm -hmm. that once again will be a resurgence. We're beginning to understand the, the challenges of delivery uh, within these fields using viral delivery, but we're exploring non-viral. Uh, ways to, to package these and then once again how do you treat really these more complex heterogeneous diseases and I think we'll really start to see how that field can develop much effect we had monoclonal antibodies you know decades ago we're really going to only at the nascent stage what we can do for for cell engine therapy uh, another thing that people are always kind of talking about is uh, AI and I see so many startup companies that throw AI and machine learning into their, their platforms and oftentimes it's hard to understand what do you mean by that, what's really mm -hmm. going to be differentiating about it, but I, I do see how that's going to impact more on our drug discovery and, and mm -hmm. discovery pathways, so really kind of streamlining the, the chemistry aspects of it, maybe coming up with like new molecules faster mm -hmm. in, in many ways and allow us to doing kind of different modalities um, more at scale mm -hmm. without having to be so empirical about it. But what I'm also curious, and maybe putting myself out of business at some point, but I haven't so much seen how we're going to employ those machine learning tools to really doing that kind of uh, analytical, like due diligence analysis, and perhaps even trend mm -hmm. prediction. So a lot of people within our organization are devoted to doing due diligence, helping set the evaluation, the kind of competitive intelligence. All of these are really prime for <laughs> machine learning tools to really start to um, make predictions about how these things are going to work. And now we have this whole abundance of data. I wanna see how those tools are gonna to kind of come to market and be able to be utilized for us to hopefully make us better decisions. Um, but there's also, you know, what is going to be the role of the human in that type of analysis, particularly when you have to assess some kind of a risk risk assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, what else would I, I want to see more is investments in, in women's health. It's still only about four to five percent of R and D. And if you think about what's not associated simply with reproductive health, it's even lower. And we're certainly, as we kind of go through these large data cohorts, really this realization that oftentimes that there are diseases that present differently in women and have or differences in um, their health disparities amongst them. And so really starting to do more development, more intentional development and inclusion of women and other in, other diversities and ethnicities into clinical trials to really help us understand, is there truly a need for developing drugs that are very specific to these indications, or do we need to just kind of understand those diseases a bit more? So I think it's really more of a precision medicine approach to how we treat you know, gender disparities in these diseases. And I would love to see how the field is able to make investments into actually understanding that from a data perspective, and then driving that to actually developing other therapeutics that are specific. So we are always going to be looking for the you know, autoimmune disorders oftentimes uh, are disproportionately affect women. So as we think about immunology indications and how we can look for maybe uh, interesting companies for the collab space, we're also thinking about innovation challenges that could also address some of these particular issues. Okay. Um, speaking of diversity and various disparities, I was recently reading an article in Forbes uh, from 2022. Um, and a point that really stood out to me is that healthcare is meant to serve all. So whether it be women or other um, minority groups, but often the workforce behind that isn't really representative um, of the people that we're looking to serve. Um, are there any suggestions that you may have to address uh, this issue? Yeah, yeah, since we were talking about, you don't have the full answers to, to all of this, you know, I began, I think, that our discussion with how important I feel that representation matters. And in terms of you being able to understand and, and craft a career path for you, it's great to see someone like yourself mm -hmm. in that role. And when I think about what does like yourself mean, it's not only ethnicity, but you know, I come from an economically disadvantaged background, certainly not a lot of people like that, that I see uh, in, in these roles. And so I really want to think about diversity across a very broad spectrum and how can we truly uplift 
everyone. And mm -hmm. so there are programs that I have uh, well, seen, for example, this company, Lab Central, they do something called the Ignite program that really is trying to go into mm -hmm. underrepresented communities and show them what career paths in the biotech could be, both as a non-PhD and a PhD scientist. And I think that just helps them to see like these jobs are lucrative, you can be trained for them, you can excel in them, you can move forward in them. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great way to kind of start not just at the scientists in the A PhD levels, but for those who can actually do the work and understand what it means to be in this field. So I look for programs like that, which I can be a part of. I also look for mentoring programs in which I can you know, just talk again about my career path and really encourage people to also <laughs> seek out their, their own mentors. There are so many people in our field who are just happy to have a conversation uh, with you, help people kind of understand what are the challenges, where they could go, um, and really develop like the skill sets that really could make them successful. I, I've seen other programs that are really trying to bring more people of color into the boardroom. So mm -hmm. being in the room where to, you know, <laughs> the room where decisions are made mm -hmm. um, can also kind of impact how you make the, the makeup of the company. It's they've heard plenty of scenarios when people's like, well, we're recruiting, we're trying to uh, be diverse, but you know, the applicants aren't there. And it really is more of like, well, where are you looking, <laughs> right? And so just having somebody there who can, can reflect that and make, perhaps enforce that too, I think is also a very good next step. But as we're talking about, this isn't just the, the challenge of other minorities to talk about this. It really is as a community for us to think about. And, you know, I am, um, you know, my husband is Latvian. So he came here as a immigrant after the fall of the Soviet Union. So we, we are coming from very different aspects of our understanding of race in America. And so when we approach things, the questions of diversity, there's always a little bit of, you know, trying to see each other's perspective on it. But from both want the same end goal, but he feels that from almost from a, a capitalist perspective, right? Having more people in the workforce is what's most important. Mm -hmm. And for me, I come from more of an equity perspective. I think everyone needs to have a chance in order to succeed, but everyone's working for those same goals. And I think there are multiple routes that we can just bring more people to the table. I feel like a common theme throughout our conversation today has been mentorship. <laughs> Um, do you have any suggestions or advice for a student or an entrepreneur when it comes to finding a mentor or how to leverage those types of relationships to really um, either, you know, learn more about their career path or discover, you know, more about, you know, a different industry or being an entrepreneur? Yeah, I approach mentorship. It's a kind of a, a, a collection, mm -hmm. right? They're all good for different purposes. You know, there are some that I just need also mentors say in your, your personal life, you know, just to kind of understand how to have um, some, you know, uh, emotional integrity and how to handle certain situations. Others that can give you uh, career advice, really understanding what their job is, how they got in that role, what are kind of the skill sets you need to do it. And then there's an even separate category of mentorship, which is really more the sponsorship. These are the people who are going to open doors for you and help you get to that that next job. So I think about some of my like friends, I think I, I highlighted how I had an ex-boyfriend who was giving me like mm -hmm. advice. He's still kind of like a mentor and just like someone who's always just encouraged me to kind of go out there and, and continue to push and, and be myself. And then I have uh, other mentors from more of a professional background that really helped me kind of craft, you know, who you are as a professional and where you want to go and push me to think beyond what I thought my career level uh, should be. And, and then there are others that I am still, you know, seeking mentors and seeking sponsors for, you know, if I want to move into the C-suite, like how do I do that? Who should I be talking to? What are the skill sets that they think? So a lot of it is, is networking, mm -hmm. um, meeting people, but then finding people who do want to support you, who want to help you on the mission. I'm finding certainly in the, the Cambridge area, there's a ton of people who are open to these uh, discussions. Oftentimes your, your school, your alumni network, is also quite key. As I said, there are so many phone calls. I answer the phone all the time, particularly if a high school student, college student just wants to have a conversation with me. Like I make time to, to do that because I understand how important it is, hey, how hard it is for them A, to kind of take that step to even make that call. It is scary. <laughs> yeah, yes. It's very scary, like just to approach it. So I appreciate that. And then tell them like, you know, feel free to, to come back. We don't always have to have a list of 10 topics that you want to address. It's just 
let's get to know each other. Let's get to see what you want. And if I can be of help for you, uh, otherwise maybe perhaps there's somebody else in my network that I can connect you to. Great, thank you. So I'd like to shift a bit and learn a bit more about you outside of biotech. Mm -hmm. Do you have any passions? I heard you say you did biking with a friend. That's <laughs> yeah. really cool. So what, yeah, what are you yeah, doing yeah. in your so free time? So that was uh, <laughs> like a, absolutely probably over a decade um, ago. I think that, that same girlfriend, she has like 10 year old twins now. <laughs> and so it's like, yeah, it's been a while since we went bike riding through Cam Cambodia. But we actually used to do uh, mini triathlons a triathlon sprint, so it was in much better shape back, back then, um, where we would like, you know, do all the, the bike riding. I also have a very, what I consider a healthy fear of the water, so the swimming part was a very oh, yeah. challenging component of me, but I love going on like long bike rides. Um, I have a three-year-old daughter now, so I don't have the time to really do those long bike rides, but mm -hmm. I recently you know, bought her a toddler seat, and so now we're kind of biking around like our town and Passing main bridge. Along. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I see she, she, she likes it. She's not biking herself yet, but she's, she's taking her along with me. And then um, for us, we're, we're just really trying to kind of expose her to a lot of different um, traveling, different parts of the world. So. We, I, I love going to hot springs and really like the therapeutic aspects of, of baths. As I said, my husband comes from more of an Eastern European background with a lot of bath, you know, Russian bath culture. Mm. You know, I love a good, you know, hot spring. So we've been, you know, going around to natural hot springs and, and Iceland and Costa Rica. Wow. We took the baby to the Azores that has these great hot springs. And now this summer we're going to do a little driving tour through Switzerland and Austria. Nice. We're gonna hit some hot springs on the way too. So my, my daughter gets to see some mountains and some cows and then we'll all take her to <laughs> the hot springs. Nice, yeah. nice. And speaking of family, you know, what are some ways that you're able to sort of balance, you know, your busy career with your family? Mm -hmm. I feel like it's, it's difficult. Do you have any suggestions or tips for Yeah, her? I, before I had kid, I never understood when, you know, parents would you know, have to cut a work trip short or, or run home. I was like, just leave the kid. Like, what's the, what's the problem now? I said, no, you can't. Right. <laughs> you can't do it. And even if they're not there, they're still like on your mind. Mm -hmm. And so it is a bit distracting. And, you know, some days I balance better than others. Like there have been calls, you know, if I have a early morning 7 a.m. call, um, my kid wakes up. And I was like, okay, she's just gonna have to sit here <laughs> with me. And she, sometimes she's like polite while she's on the call and allows me to talk. Other times it's a little bit of back and forth. But I think uh, since the pandemic, everyone has been a bit more that blurring of the work mm -hmm. life balance. <laughs> like it's, if you're home, there's always like a, a little bit of the, the parent um, or personal life that has to be uh, in flux. And so you certainly try to kind of size some time for like yourself, but I do like to just like if I'm home to kind of mm -hmm. dedicate that time to to some family. Being present. Um, yeah, home. try to be present, but there's oftentimes you can't. Like we were up a bit last night, I was working on some slide decks, my husband was watching the beat. We realized that it's like nine o'clock, 10 o'clock and our kid, our three-year-old kid is still up. <laughs> so <laughs> like, we, probably <laughs> should, yeah, yeah, we probably should be, be killing that. But, I think, you know, I don't have a, it's a personal choice, like how you can really define that balance. But I do feel like someone once gave me this advice, like if you are a, a spouse, a, a parent and a worker, like it's going to be very hard when you're doing all three of those things at your best. Right. <laughs> so sometimes you're just going to have to pick today. I'm going to be a better parent than I am going to be a worker. <laughs> today, I'm going to be a better worker and like may have to, you know, um, sacrifice that with my spouse. And then there are some days just for the relationship, you got to put your spouse or your partner first too. So it's always a bit of a, a juggling act. Have to give yourself some grace. Yeah, exactly. And that's the other thing, a bit of forgiveness too. Yeah. Like you're not gonna get it right every time. And, and a lot of people don't use the word balance anymore. <laughs> they call it like work-life harmonization because yeah. there's really no, it's yeah, not like, it's not, equal. it's not a nine to five <laughs> life. I think for a lot of us, you don't just like go to the office and you come home and then you're done and then you balance it. It's really like, my my child is on my lap during the call and like whoever's on the other side is gonna just have to enjoy it and as i say post pandemic i've seen a lot of people have their pets <laughs> yeah, the on pets. the calls the pets like the you know the, the classic cat or like walking past the camera screen so it sounds like it's a bit more complicated than just you know a simple straight line down in the sand like this is where work ends and where life begins especially if you do some work at home yeah. um it's a lot more 
complicated than yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But I do like to come into the office. So mm -hmm. that is one thing about being in a, a life science incubator. There are always mm -hmm. lab scientists that are there. So it's yeah. also the expectation that I like to come into the offices as much as I can. Um, also, my, my husband works uh, remotely, and so uh, he's always home. And so it's nice, nice. to, <laughs> and well, you know, then you become like his only co-worker, so he's like very <laughs> chatty. So it's like, okay, sometimes it's nice to also kind of get the break. But I, I do like that sense of community that you have in the office. So it's actually still very important to me. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, well, we really appreciate you joining us today, Fiona. Thanks for being part of this. No, really. Thank you guys for, for the invitation. I look forward to working further with Nucleate throughout the year.